blasphemy, I mean, this is, um, I'm, well, I was born in Pakistan, you know, uh, blasphemy law is something which, you know, the state uh, enforces there, and unfortunately, it has been misused when it, I mean, even, I, I would say even its proper use is a misuse, but nevertheless, it's been misused even by its own mm -hmm. definition. So my question is, why do we need something like a blasphemy law? Because when I look at any law, it's to reduce victim is to sort of say I can't if, if I were to steal your watch you're the victim because I'm taking something from you if I were to injure you I'm taking away your your personhood or I'm violating your body but with blasphemy even if I say, say something offensive like for example if I say I don't like God I think God is an idiot or anything like that who is the victim here why do we need a law to stop people saying that hmm. so uh, the, the blasphemy law has been misunderstood uh, the um, there's nothing in the Quran that says that uh, one who commits the act of blasphemy uh, should be punished in, in this punishment. life, yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there's certainly warning of dire punishment in life hereafter. Yeah, but in this world, but in this world, no, there is no such punishment. On the contrary, it is clear that uh, people committed blasphemy in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or apostasy, if we use mm. that term as well. Um, some people were saying to each other, according to the Quran, let us accept Islam by morning and then renege in the afternoon uh, so that uh, other people may leave with us. Right. Uh, so, uh, if, if the Prophet, peace be upon him, were penalizing people for blasphemy at that time, uh, nobody would have dared to do this. Mm -hmm. but, but in fact, he wasn't penalizing, and that's why people could actually play around with the religion as they did at that time. So, but that's between them and God. So, I mean, because from your point of view, there is no ground, uh, Islamic grounds for blasphemy. No, in fact, uh, on, on the contrary, there is every Islamic ground uh, to. Um, I mean, there there is no uh, Islamic ground for prescribing a punishment, punishment yeah, in yes, this life yeah, for, for blasphemy. Yeah. Um, on the contrary, there 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 is every reason uh, from the Quran itself to say that. Uh, uh, we should not have a penalty for blasphemy. The Quran says, for example, in the second chapter, the 256th verse, La ikraha fid deen, there's mm -hmm. no compulsion in religion. Mm -hmm. And this is stated in a kind of an, in a categorical manner. Just like, you know, it's the same kind of grammatical formation that gives us our kalima when we say, La ilaha illallah, there is no God. So, La ilaha, uh, the, the way it ends mm -hmm. with the A ending there, it, it indicates it's a kind of a categorical statement. Okay. There is no, there is no God, and then we say except Allah. There is no, there is no yeah. So in this case, it says uh, no compulsion in religion, and there's no exception given. Okay. Um, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, my, my question is, how is it that a lot of Muslim countries and a lot of Muslim communities, even in, in this country uh, and in the Western countries, if there's like, for example, a cartoon of the Prophet or someone says something against Islam that is, oh, a bit touchy feely, I'm not really sure. There seems to be uproar and unfortunately that supposed over into violence or threats um, would you how would you respond in a Muslim country to someone drawing a card to the Prophet yes on a personal level it's bad and in a divine level it's wrong but should the state get involved and punish someone um, the of course state laws always change and and even many modern dem democratic societies will have laws that, that um, you know prevent people from causing strife or um, inciting violence, inciting yeah. violence, yeah. or disturbing the peace, or something like this. Uh, recently, uh, the uh, Haaretz uh, newspaper, or was it Jer the Jerusalem Post, uh, reported that uh, uh, some a journalist uh, ran into trouble with their authorities there because he he drew a, a cartoon of uh, some of the public officials. Uh, looking like pigs, right. that there were pigs in suits. Um, so some things are deemed unacceptable within a society, and mm -hmm. societies evolve in what they can accept, and um, societies become more mature, and you know people can laugh things off, mm -hmm. and we can have political cartoons. Um, uh, but but this is not a religious matter. If for it to be a religious matter, there would have to be something in the Quran that says, okay, nobody can draw cartoons. And, and I, thought, I thought that was because I remember I went to Muslim school. They were saying you can't draw. Any cartoon of the Prophet or even the Sahaba. I thought that was, is that Islamic or is that Islamic culture? Mm, this one is a complicated matter. A lot of things which, uh, you know, people have adopted as Islamic culture, they, they may credit to Islamic statements, uh, like statements in the Quran or in uh, statements attributed to our Prophet mm. Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, but sometimes a closer examination uh, shows that uh, these things have been overemphasized. 
even if there is something there. As for the matter of drawing like pictures of human beings, mm -hmm. um, it, it's a good thing that in hindsight that Muslims did not draw uh, images of our Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him because the danger was always that uh, people might take such an image and start worshipping. Right. Uh, that, that image and uh, it turned out for the betterment of the Muslim community in this respect that we don't worship the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. But there's uh, no you're saying direct link from the Quran saying do not draw Prophet or do not draw Sahaba. Uh, yeah, uh, to be very clear from the start there are statements in, in the hadith that prohibit us from drawing uh, pictures of human beings mm -hmm. uh, but there's no such prohibition in the Quran. In fact there is an indication in the Quran that uh, Sulaiman salam, the, the Prophet Solomon uh, had jinns making for him uh, carvings mm -hmm. and um, uh, one might take that as evidence that you could actually have three-dimensional statues that does not, uh, yes. Um, but, but in the hadith we have this uh, prohibition. So what was meant by this prohibition? Uh, what's, what's the problem here with, with make, drawing a picture? So one problem that has been mentioned by, by ex uh, expositors of the hadith is that it can lead to this kind of uh, worshipping of the mm -hmm. image and, and we see that to be a good thing that Muslims adhere to this. Uh, but uh, another, um, the rationale that is actually given in the most authentic narratives of, from the Prophet peace be upon him about this is that uh, the, uh, this is a kind of a challenge to God. God is the creator and you are creating something it looks like you're challenging God. So God will um, put you to shame on the day of judgment by, uh, by challenging you in return to, 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 make create, come you know, to life. put yeah. life into that thing right. you won't be able to do it. I mean, but but, this, that and, well, but this, ra this rationale does not seem to be itself uh, reasonable. Uh, because uh, naturally when one is, as a human being, drawing a picture, we know the difference between a picture and a live uh, yeah, course, thing. Yeah. Uh, it's only uh, a, a kind of image that is one tries to capture or, you know, an image of one's yeah. mind that one tries to put on paper. One isn't trying to create uh, in, in, def in, um, in defiance of God. Um, otherwise we wouldn't be able to make anything, like God makes things and, and we try to make things like them. We try to make the camera like the human eye, for example. That's technically. It, it, it doesn't mean that we're in yeah. defiance of God, mm -hmm. we're just benefiting from what, knowing what God has done and learning from that. So in, in short, uh, we, we need to look again at that uh, common idea that Muslims are not allowed to draw altogether. And it seems to me that that idea became widespread among Muslims uh, from a, a Jewish source because in the in the Bible uh, we're not only prohibited from worshipping images but from making images altogether. So unfortunately we've, we've borrowed this from... A, a, a lot of times things have been borrowed from the previous communities by not so much borrowing but assimilation. Like when an idea is widespread among uh, the, the early Muslim communities, so uh, people forget where it actually came from. Isn't the same yeah, so with stoning? There's no stoning in the Quran. No okay. stoning in the Quran, no stoning only lashing, but stoning in hadith. And you stoning is also borrowed from... Well, stoning is also known from the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, so that could be the source of it and the reason it became widespread in, in, in the Muslim would community. You, you or... That's what was saying. Uh, well, well, let me say something Sorry, more about the stoning. It, it is possible, it is possible that the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, applied uh, the stoning rule uh, before the revelation of the 24th chapter came to him. Uh, because it, it is known more generally that uh, in things that he was not specifically instructed about by God, he would follow the Jewish practice uh, on, on the presumption that this Jewish practice goes back to revelation from God in the first place. But once he got a specific revelation on, on that matter, he would have changed and then adopted the specific revelation. So it seems that the 24th chapter of the Quran uh, may have been revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, after uh, so he had what's applied. What's the, the 24th? It's, it's uh, well, that's the chapter that says that you uh, lash, oh, lash. The, the adulterer, whether male or female. So it's some stoning to lash and you bring it down? Uh, well, the, the chapter itself does not say it's bringing anything down. It's just giving a prescription. This is what you do with the adulterer. So if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, applied the stoning rule as as is depicted in some hadith, mm. that must have been before, before uh, the revelation of this chapter to him. But of course, Muslim scholars didn't take it this way. Generally, they tried to reconcile the two and say that both are valid, uh, but it must mean, they said, that the Quranic verse is only about stoning the unmarried adulterer, fornicator or fornicatress, and as for the married adulterer, they get a, more, a stiffer penalty 
uh, because they had no reason to. They, they had the legal they were married avenue as well. already. They were already married. They could have easily exercised okay. their desires with their spouses, but they went beyond that and they committed adultery. So they got a, bit, a greater penalty, which is uh, yeah. stony. So um, this is very interesting because it seems like um, Muslims almost have a lot of cultural or religious or historical baggage that we're carrying for no reason. Like for example, yes. when it comes to different punishments or different, like, I understand you can't draw a cartoon, you can't say this, you can't say that. So for me, it seems like we need to sort of uh, shake off a lot of this sort of uh, dust that's collected on us, or yes. mentally, physically, And of course, culturally. you asked about the blasphemy law. Uh, it, the blasphemy law is clear in the Bible. Uh, and that's, you say that's taken from... Well, we don't know. We, I mean, I don't have it. I can't assert things that we don't know, but we can say but, definitely... But it's possible that influence the it's way... It's possible that within that milieu, that this was what is known, that uh, this is how you deal with the apostate, according to the Bible. You, so therefore, you, you just... Uh, people might have just simply assimilated that in, within the Muslim community. Amazing. And uh, sometimes what happens... Uh, in the study of world religions more generally, we know that uh, within a religious community, once something is accepted to be true, mm. uh, the community finds a way of crediting that principle back to their founder. So uh, for this reason, uh, some people doubt that Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, uh, set the golden rule. Mm. Whatever you would not... Uh, uh, have done unto you, do not do unto others. Yep. Um, they say because this golden rule was already widespread, it was already known mm. uh, but, uh, to, to have been a motto or principle uh, enunciated by, by others before Jesus and around Jesus and at the time of Jesus and in the time of the early um, uh, Christian community. So yep. once uh, everybody accepted this to be a good principle, they, just... uh, they naturally assumed that Jesus must have said this and then eventually it gets circulated as an actual saying of his. Something similar would have happened in Muslim societies as well. Once Muslims came to accept something as true, uh, they, they naturally imagine that this must have come from the Prophet peace be upon him. And... For where else do you get truth? Uh, and, and so, you know, one might easily say, okay, I got this from my teacher, and well, where did your teacher get it from? Well, he must have got it from his teacher. And where did his teacher get it from? Mm -hmm. Well, he must have got it from the prophet, see? So sometimes people assume things and, and pass on their, their assumption, which to them was the truth, as though it were the truth. So it's almost like we have something in our hand and we say, well, I must have got it from you, and then you must have got it, and then we create a or a justification or a story as to why it's now in my hand. Yes. Whereas it could have not been the reason why it's in, in my hand in the first place. Yes. So and, and in yeah. fact, I, I don't mean to, to um, insinuate that all hadiths are oh, no, no, this, but, but, it, but yeah. it, the, pro the problematic ones um, can be dealt with with this background knowledge in mind. That uh, when, we, when we're dealing with uh, a reported saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, yeah. um, it, it's, it's not like hearing the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying it to you directly. Uh, you, you're getting it through a chain of narrators and uh, well, just as susceptible to influence from different religions, different nations, different cultures or whatever you want to call it. Yes, and, and it is well known that the early Muslim communities were such susceptible to influences from the other uh, nations. Uh, in our books of Tafsir, we have many narratives which are referred to as the Israeliyat, the, the basically narratives from the Jewish sources. Mm. And um, uh, Muslim scholars just lapped up this type of information and reported them as commentary and explanation of Quranic verses. Mm -hmm. Some of that is good for us, otherwise we would have the bare uh, narrative of the Quran which gives us a kind of a skeleton of uh, certain stories of past prophets, for example, mm. and we would not have that flesh, fleshed out uh, detail uh, that we find so interesting and useful. But at the same time, we have to be cautious in accepting uh, some of these details because many of them actually go contrary to what the Quran itself is trying to teach us. Very, very interesting. Shabir Ali, uh, <laughs> Sheikh Shabir, I should say. Thank you so much for time. I feel like I've learned so much from yourself, and I would love to continue this conversation in the future with yourself. Sure. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Guys, uh, please check out uh, Shabir Ali, uh, Sheikh Shabir Ali on YouTube and, and on social media. He's got some great videos coming up. Your, your um, what's, the, what's the, your series, your YouTube? Quran Speaks. Uh, the Quran Speaks. So please check it out. Sheikh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, my brother. Thank you so All much. Right. All right, guys, see you next